The purpose of today's lesson is to do an overview of the concept of perfusion, which is the next concept we'll be covering in NUR 200. What we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to look at the essentials of perfusion, talk about physical assessment, and do a brief overview of the exemplars we'll be covering as we move through this concept. It is a big concept, so you need to really pay attention and put some time into learning it. Perfusion essentials. What is it? It's a provision of a continuous supply of blood to every cell of the body. So with perfusion, you have to think about what is responsible perfusion for perfusion, what's involved in perfusion, and how do you assess it. Okay, if you think about it, I know a lot of plumbers, it's a pump and a bunch of pipes. When the pump's not working, it's a problem. When the pipes are clogged, it's a problem. Let's move along. The exemplars we're going to be covering are angina and myocardial infarction, reperfusion strategies, pulmonary embolus and basic cardiac conduction and rhythms. We're going to start off with a basic overview of cardiovascular risk and atherosclerosis, which you did cover in NUR 180 and you should bring forward. Key words that are going to be very important as you move through this concept. Things like cardiac output. Your pre-class lesson involves looking at some of these words. Preload and afterload. I can't stress this enough. The better that you know them, the better it's going to be as you move into the far cardiac farm and learn it. Ejection fraction. If you're doing any kind of cardiac clinical, you've probably seen these words, but they're important. And depolarization, which is about how the electrical signal work, moves through the heart. Once again, the related concepts with perfusion are many but some of them are acid-base balance because when the body doesn't get enough blood or oxygen, it goes into a lactic acidosis. Cellular regulation, right? We need blood to carry oxygen. Right? We talked about anemia as it relates to cellular regulation. Certainly oxygenation, comfort, cognition. If you're hypoxic, you're not going to think straight, trust me. Fluids and electrolytes and intracranial regulation. When you move forward to NUR 210, a lot of what you talk about as it relates to neurologic changes is perfusion in the brain and alterations in perfusion in the brain. You can look at alterations perfusion across the lifespan. Within the pediatric population, most of what you're dealing with is related to congenital heart defects, the most common being tetralogy of Fallot. We're going to focus on the adult for this lesson, which is coronary artery disease, vascular disease, which you had in NUR 180, and age-related changes to cardiovascular status. One thing that's important to go back and review is your modifiable versus your non-modifiable risk factors. And one thing I did learn is that you've been taught in the past that diabetes type 1 is considered non-modifiable. However, diabetes type 2 is considered modifiable. In the past I had said both types were mod not or modifiable, but I understand you've been taught differently, so I'm moving along and teaching you that. When you're looking at physical assessment, a lot of what you're doing is going to relate back to perfusion. When you walk in the room, the first thing you think about is mental status and cognition. Okay? Alterations in cognition can sometimes be related to an alteration in perfusion. Certainly your vital signs tell you a lot about your body's ability to perfuse the major organs and the extremities. Heart sounds and apical pulse also are going to tell you a lot about your perfusion status and you should always do an apical pulse for 60 seconds. Peripheral pulses, okay, you want to think about grading them from plus one to plus four. And urine output, you're thinking kidneys and I'm thinking cardiac output. One of the biggest changes, one of the things you're going to see after vital sign changes, because that's going to be the first thing you see with a change in cardiac output, is an alteration in urine output because the kidneys get a lot of the blood supply and when it drops, your urine output is going to drop. And then there's your health interview or your subjective data, so things that your patient tells you that point you in the direction of an alteration in perfusion. This slide just looks at different cardiac clues that you can think about when you're doing a head-to-toe assessment. I know you've had physical assessment in the past, but it's always good to revisit it and realize that a lot of things from head-to-toe are going to be altered when you have an alteration in perfusion. Let's look at cardiac circulation. There's basically two main areas out of the aorta where that will perfuse your heart. One is the 
right coronary artery, and the other is on the left side, starting with the left main coronary artery, which branches into the circumflex and the left anterior descending coronary artery. So when you see charts, they'll talk about patients having a blockage in the RCA, which is the right coronary artery, or the left main, the left anterior descending called the LAD, or the left circumflex. The right side tends to feed the sinoatrial node, and it also is going to feed the inferior wall of the heart, whereas the left side is going to feed most of the left ventricle, the anterior and posterior walls of the heart. You should be familiar with the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis and realize that the role of inflammation is growing when it, as it, as it um, relates to the atherosclerotic process. A lot of what happens often relates back to an injury to the vessel wall at which you have an inflammatory response which becomes a calcified plaque. And then oftentimes what happens that causes the MI is a thrombus that forms or gets lodged in that narrowed area. Things to consider with patho is ineffective tissue perfusion. So when someone has coronary artery disease, that's the biggest risk, is ineffective tissue perfusion. We're going to talk about stable versus unstable angina versus Prince metals angina. We're going to move through to acute coronary syndrome and MI. And much like you see in this thing, there's stages and atherosclerosis, the chronic process. There's also a chronic process or stages of coronary artery disease and we're going to do a concept map that looks at that um, to kind of get an idea of the progression and care as you move along in the different stages. Some of the diagnostics that are going to be important as we move into this concept serum cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. CRP stands for C-reactive protein. It's an inflammatory marker that's used to look at the client's systemic inflammation, but it's been known to speak to the risk for coronary artery disease or the risk for cardiovascular problems. The ECG, which was what you see below, it's a picture of the electrical activity in the heart. But the thing is, when you have an alteration in perfusion to the heart, your electrical activity is going to change. And so what you see here on this slide is an abnormal EKG where the client is experiencing myocardial injury in part of it. And we'll talk a little bit about those changes in class. Stress testing, okay, that's kind of your next go-to. Cardiac enzymes, and I haven't put it here, but coronary angiography, which is taking them to the cardiac calf, and also cardiac CAT scan. Farm, I cannot underestimate in this lesson. There is a ton of farm as it relates to cardiac, and I'm going to do my best to get you guys there and help you to understand it. Okay? And what you see here is the main crux of it. it. We may add some things in as we go, but these are the biggies. You can look at the angioplasty and stent process by looking at this, link, this video link, or you can go to YouTube. There's a ton of YouTube videos. We're also going to look at it in class. Things we're going to cover in class are the concerns that you have pre-procedure and things you need to consider, and then care of the patient post-procedure, because that's something that's going to be very important, and it's a concept you need to consider as you move into this concept. Other areas of revascularization is the idea of the coronary artery bypass get graft, or as we like to call the cabbage. Once again, we're going to look at pre-procedure versus post-procedure and the care of the patient and nursing considerations in both ends of the procedure because that's important to know as well as far as nursing care goes. Once we're finished with cardiovascular disease, and that is a huge, huge exemplar, we're going to talk about pulmonary embolus. This is good because it lays the groundwork for when we do mobility and talk about fat embolus, which is a type of pulmonary embolus. Considerations, one of the big things is a risk factor. What is a risk factor for pulmonary embolus? Manifestations and then treatment or nursing care. And this cartoon here gives you a nice visual of things to consider when you're caring for somebody with a pulmonary embolus. Okay, basic arrhythmias. You need to not let this make your head explode. In order to know abnormal, you need to know normal. And that means going back to cardiac physiology from anatomy and physiology 
and taking a look at it and starting to understand it better. Okay, you need to understand how the electrical system in the heart works normally before we talk about abnormal. And what we're going to do is very basic. And Hopefully it's going to lay the groundwork as you move into NUR 210 and start talking about the lethal dysrhythmias as well as some of the treatments. Be familiar with the components of cardiac depolarization and repolarization, and some of that's part of your pre-class assignment. Okay? There's a nice YouTube video that talks about the cardiac conduction system and its relationship with EKG. Hey, and you should do that and be comfortable with that as you arrive to class Monday and Tuesday. This is a visual of your cardiac conduction, conduction system, and you'll note that the sinoatrial node is the beginning of the cardiac conduction node, also called the sinus node or the SA node, and you'll hear that. So when someone's in a normal sinus rhythm, it means that all of the heartbeats are being initiated by the sinoatrial node. From there, you go to the atrioventricular node, bundle of Hiss, the bundle branches, and to the Purkinje fibers. And we'll take a look at that in class. The P wave, you think about atrial depolarization, and that's your SA node firing. The PR interval represents the travel of the cardiac stimulus from the sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node. And then the QRS complex basically represents ventricular depolarization. It's the stimulus moving from the AV node through the bundle of Hiss and the Purkinje fibers. This is an example of a one QRS complex, or one um, complex in a patient's EKG. And you can see there's a PR interval, the P wave, QRS. There's an ST segment, which is going to become very important as you move through to coronary artery disease, and then the T wave. The T wave represents the reset button, or ventricular repolarization. So it kind of goes back to its resting state to prepare for the next electrical stimulus. Ways to determine heart rate. Okay, I'm going to show you the easy way, and then Mrs. Mundell or Mrs. Wessel or one of our other instructors is going to show you the little bit more specific way in NUR210. What you do is you look at a six-second strip, and I will show you the mark. There's three-second marks on your rhythm strips. If you look at a six-second strip and count the amount of complexes in six seconds and multiply it by 10, you should end up with an approximate estimation of a patient's heart rate. For testing purposes, I will only give you six second strips. Below you can see a little bit more complex one where you take a complex and then take the next block and go 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 40, 30, I think. Um, so that is the way that I learned, but that's a little bit more complex than I'm going to need for you for the purposes of this class. Now I just want you to recognize normal, fast, and slow. We're going to look at tachys and bradys. So what you have to think about what's the defining criteria of a tachycardia versus a bradycardia, and what symptoms might a patient come in with. I'm going to ask you these questions as we talk about this exemplar. PVC is a premature ventricular contraction. Like I said, I know a lot of plumbers, and so it always reminds me of PVC pipe. It's not that. It's a premature ventricular contraction. They occur early and they look a lot different. So I always say if it's early and ugly and like doesn't look at all like the normal rhythm, you need to think about the fact that it is a PVC. It, usually it's a sign of irritability and the common causes are hypoxia, hypokalemia, um, some sort of irritability within the heart. Sometimes if you drink too much caffeine you can throw PVCs. If you're having problems with um, congestive heart failure, patients may have a lot of PVCs. Atrial fibrillation I'm going to cover in class, but one thing you need to understand is the causes and even more important, treatment and complications. In NUR 180 you should have looked at a video that discussed atrial fib and stroke risk. I will include that in class or in the, in the um, module on Blackboard. So the take home message is you need to check the patient. You need to assess, assess, assess. You need to look at the patient's symptoms and think about your first two things are electrolyte imbalance and hypoxia. Thank you very much for your time and attention. You need to look at your pre-assignment and complete the questions that are written there. I look forward to seeing you in class and reviewing this. Thank you.